the Yezu FTX1 field model, which I have the Optima model as well. Been a lot of talk, a lot of conversations, a lot of speculation, a lot of comments, a lot of complaints, a lot of positive reactions and negative reactions to this radio over the course of the last month since it came out. And today we're going to talk about five things that are wrong with this radio, or maybe five things that I don't like about this radio, and I want to know what your comments are below. Let's go. I saw a video online last week, and it said something along the lines, I don't even remember what channel it was right now. There's a lot of videos out here about this radio. And it said something along the lines of, ham tubers are all praising this radio, but they're getting paid to do it, and... None of these reviews are honest, and this, 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 and this, and this, and blah, 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 blah. And something about how, you know, nobody's given this radio a bad review because Yezu's paying them all to do it. Okay. I've said a thousand times on this channel that Yezu's never paid me, Icom's never paid me, Kenwood's never paid me, Gigaparts has never paid me to do a, a, a review of a radio. And I, 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 I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to say it any other way. So that's just simply not true. Okay, I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm moving on. But today, no radio is perfect. No radio is perfect. So today, I'm going to tell you about the five things that I think were a swing and a miss for this radio, for the field model specifically. Okay, and this could really kind of apply to the Optima model as well, but today we're going to be talking about the field radio. The first thing, okay, the first thing, and this, and everyone, when I got this, this exact model at Dayton Hamvention, the first thing everyone said was that it was heavy. If you take the battery off the back of it, it's still heavy. i got a signal stick on it right now. So we're going to talk about the, uh, the BNC ports here in a second. Okay, it's heavy. It's about the same size as the Icom IC705, but it's much heavier. Much heavier than the 705. I, I don't know about much heavier. I'm not sure about much heavier. My IC705 is currently locked into a Armalock cage with an external battery, and I don't feel like taking it apart right now. So maybe I'll grab a 705 from a friend or something and see what, how it compares to this. I'm going to weigh them both and see what they weigh. But you can tell when you pick up this radio, you can tell that it is heavier than its ICOM counterpart. Okay, you know, is it heavy? Is it too heavy? I don't know. But it's going to be, but if, if, you're, if you're wanting to backpack this radio, then it's going to be a heavy piece of kit. So as a side note, I will say this because... I've been watching a few other videos about this as well. There's a difference between field. This is called a field radio. And Gaston, Tech Prepper, he made a video saying that he doesn't, he's, he's going to sell his. He doesn't like it. He's like, this is not a field radio. They used field as a buzzword. It's not a field radio. And I'm like, okay, I see where he's coming from. And I'm not necessarily saying he's wrong. But I think it's important to realize there's a difference between field and backpackable. I've been saying for years that the IC705 is, uh, IC is not a backpackable radio because you would either take a chance on puncturing your screen if you were to stuff it into a backpack and hike up a mountain with it, or you'd have to put a cage around it, making it even more bulky because th this one and the 705 both have large screens on them. So you'd have to put a cage around it or a topper or put an extra bag in it, and it makes it more bulky, more, more heavy, and less portable in my opinion. So... Just because this is called field doesn't mean it should be... Field shouldn't always be related to backpackable. And that's just... That's kind of one of the things that I wanted to talk about today. But that's a side note, okay? Number two is the BNC ports. Now, let's go over here and check out these BNC ports. Here's what the radio looks like. I want to set it... Uh, let me turn... I'm going to power this thing off real quick. Because I want to show you guys the back of the radio. Okay, so here is... This is... I mean, I, I'm, this falls under the line of... What the heck were you thinking? So this is the orientation of the radio. It sits like this, okay? And it sits like, and I like the way that w when the battery's on it, it kind of sits at an angle, so it's easy to read and easy to use with the buttons, okay? But this is the this right here is the HF BNC port, and this is the VHF UHF BNC port. Now, what do you think is going to happen if I put a, a BNC and ant vertical antenna on that right there while I'm operating? If will I be able to operate HF? with the BNC port right there, because that's where my HF antenna connects to. Why didn't they put the VHF on the top and the HF on the bottom? That doesn't make any sense to me. Why put the VHF down here? Now, I will say this also, okay, and this is also true of the IC705. When you power this thing on and you've got the BNC connected, now it's on a horizontal fashion right now. 
But we're gonna we're gonna key this up and watch the SWR meter. KC5 HWB testing. So I'm hitting the repeater. High SWR. I'm gonna go over here, and I'm gonna go to the two meter band, and just doesn't matter where I'm at here. Okay. KC5 HWB testing. You might hear that in the. Not as high as SWR, but still high SWR. And it's still high. If I were to turn the ver radio up vertically, it's still high. Huh. The SWR came up when I turned the radio up vertically. Now, that is a common issue that people complain about with the IC705 as well. Okay, so you need a pigtail on it, basically. You need a pigtail on the, on the... You need a counterpoise on it to get the SWR down. So that's, that's weird, but... It happens on the 705, so maybe it's something about this design. I don't know, but I and I, I don't really consider that an issue much because it's kind of what we're used to. Those of us who own a 705, but why are the BNC ports backwards like that? The HF should be on the bottom, and the VHF should be on the top, so that if you wanted to connect a vertical VHF antenna to your radio while you're operating POTA, and you're in the field and you've got a antenna connected via BNC to the HF port, which should be on the bottom, you could put a vertical antenna on the top, you could monitor 146.52 at the same time that you're operating HF. I said we were going to mostly talk about the field today, and that's true, but the Optima is, I have the Optima, I have the amplifier, it's around here somewhere, it's, in, it's actually inside the house right now, but I think an obvious miss was that it doesn't have a separation cable. I think a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of the comments I've got is that this should be separatable. It should have a separation cable. There should be a way to mount the amplifier in your vehicle, under the seat, behind the seat, behind the back seat, which would be the case in my truck, and run the face of the radio up top and run like a 6-foot or a 12-foot extension cable between the amplifier and the radio so that you can operate 100 watts from the vehicle and then take the face out if you wanted to, take the, take the field unit out and take it out to the park and do some QRP poda or soda with it if you wanted to. Okay, I don't disagree with that. There's been a lot of comments saying, I'm not going to buy this radio or I canceled my reservation because the separation doesn't work or it's not made to be separated. I think a couple people have successfully separated it and used it remotely with some RCA cables at this point in time. I have not tried that. And I've heard from Yezu that if you fudge up the radio by doing that, it's going to void your warranty. So just be aware. Just, I'm not telling you to do it or not to do it. I'm just saying be aware. But yeah, the, the non-separatable feature of the radio, the non-remote feature of the radio, where you can't run a longer cable between the amplifier and the head, I think that was kind of a miss as well. Would have been a lot more versatile of a radio if they would have built it in such a way where it would be able to allow that you know, straight from the factory. Okay, the next thing, and this is something that legit is a problem. I'll show you why. If you guys haven't seen Jason's video yet, okay, he did this video about, and it's called the Yezu, FT, Yezu FTX has a flaw. And uh, we're going to listen to a short clip here real quick. You uh, can always define four, five, six different kind of canned messages. And we can do that right here. But there's no way to insert these into a, a reply because I can't figure out how to reply on this radio. I literally think they forgot to put a reply option in the APRS messages. And that's exactly what they did. That's exactly what they did because Jason made this video and then Yezu responds right here. And they admit that that is a missing feature. So... Props to them for admitting a drastic uh, increase. A shout out to those that tried to help me in the comments of the previous video figure out how to reply to an APRS message. It turns out it absolutely is not there. And also a big shout out to those who suggested updating the firmware. I had actually filmed that video a few days before that firmware update came out. I did go ahead and do that and I did see a little bit of improvement on the receive of the APRS, but not a drastic uh, increase. So I'm going to continue testing with... So there's no way to reply to an APRS message currently with the current firmware. I just updated the firmware on this on my own radio, and I, ha I recorded a video about how to do it. You guys will see that. You, you guys probably have already seen that at the time this video you're watching right now 
will post. It, uh, this The firmware update video will post first. They did make some upgrades to it. They did make some fixes. They did change some things, and it is improving. But APRS reply is missing. And Yeezy, if you go watch Jason's video, you watch the whole video there, and I'll link those in the description below, but he found a flaw. Yezu watched his video. They replied to him and said, yep, you're right. There's no way to reply. We're going to have to fix that, so they're going to add it in later. Again, props to Yezu for responding, reaching out and saying, yeah, yeah, that's, that's something we're going to have to address. Okay, at least they could have ignored him. They could have argued with him. They didn't do that. They were pretty professional about it, in my opinion, so... There's that. Okay, the last and final... That's four things. The last and final thing. Thing number five. Thing <laughs> thing number five. And these are just uh, some things I came up with on my own. I'd be interested to see what you guys have, if you have this radio, what your experience is with the operation of the radio and what you think they can improve. So when I took this into the field, or when I will take it back into the field... I will feed this thing most likely with Mezzi and Plony Coax. Mezzi and Plony Coax is the sponsor of today's video. You can always save a 20% discount with the coupon code of HR2Cables at the link in the description below. That discount applies to the cables, the connectors, the tools they use to put the coax together, all kinds of stuff from Mezzi and Plony. Thank you, Mezzi and Plony, for supporting this channel. Let's talk about point number five. The last thing we're going to talk about is the battery, the battery on the back of the FTX1. Now, According to the manual, the battery requires a certain amount of voltage and wattage. Right here, USB PD, 45 watt and 15 volt at 2 amps. So it requires a 15 volt, 45 watt charger to charge this battery. And the reason I have this Gigaparts box in front of the camera right now is because this is the latest Gigaparts Explorer box. This new PD port right here which has a 65-watt uh, USB-C charger on it, a 65-watt PD USB-C port on it right there, will absolutely 100% charge this radio, this battery, the battery and the radio, actually. So this Gigaparts box does work just fine for charging the USB-C battery on the FTX-1 field. Now, as I said a minute ago, you're not going to be lugging this big battery box or a large 15-volt PD charging supply up a hill or up a mountain. The word field, once again, is it does not mean backpackable because you wouldn't be able to charge this battery via a regular charging brick. Now, some I've, I've tried two or three charging bricks. One of them works and two of them do not. So it's kind of a miss, in my opinion, that I, it's great that it has USB-C. On both the radio and the battery. The battery has a USB-C port on it. You can charge the battery. You can charge the radio. You can charge the battery through the radio with USB-C. I'm going to demonstrate that here in a minute. And you can charge the battery through the radio with a 12-volt power source as well. Just by plugging in the power poles on it. And I'm going to show you that right here. But how is that field worthy? I mean, what kind of charging source are you going to have to take with you to go up a mountain. Again, I don't really think this is mountain backpackable radio, but some of you are going to want to try that. So, how, Or take it into the field for a few hours and you're going to lug around a big battery box with you. I usually do that anyway, but I drive to POTA so it doesn't bother me. So are you going to do that with it? Now, I will say this. Once the battery is fully charged, it'll last about 9 or 10 hours. So if you're going hiking up a mountain overnight or you're going to do a drive up summit and camp overnight, you'll probably have plenty of battery to work with over the next, over overnight or through the evening or morning hours the next morning if you camp out overnight or something like that. So the battery does last a long time, but the fact that it takes such a large power source to charge it is a little bit, a little bit of a fail. As far, I mean, if you're going to call it a field radio, that's my thing. If you're going to call it a field radio, that's the problem. So I'm going to show you right here. I've got this USB-C port right here plugged into the battery box that I just showed you, and you can plug it in to this battery via this way, just like that. And that's a charging light right there that's charging the battery directly from that Gigaparts battery box. Now, the other way we can do it is I can take this and plug this into the radio right here. And that's plugged into the radio and it's charging the battery. So you can charge 
with the same type of PD power source, PD USB-C power source, you can charge the radio through the USB-C cable. You can charge the battery through the USB-C cable. And this way you will get, well, now I, I'm not sure if you get, you know, that's a good question. I wonder if you get a full 10 watts on that or not. It'll tell you right here when I go to the menu. Yes, it does. Okay, right there it says RF power 10 watts. If I took off this external power source, that number drops to 6 watts right there. So now it's at 6 watts, and now it's at 10 watts. So you can absolutely run a full 10 watts out of this radio by using the USB-C charger into the radio itself. You can also use the 12-volt charger, this guy right here that I put power poles on. I'm going to take this off right here, turn this back around. We're going to plug this in right there. We're going to take the power pole connection, and now I'm running direct 12 volts into the into the radio and it is still charging the battery so that's three ways to charge the battery but all of them require a pretty beefy either a full 12 volt power supply like a 12 volt battery or a 12 volt power supply plugged into ac mains or something like that or a minimum of 45 watt power delivery port from USB-C, which is not very field capable in my opinion. So those are the five things that I think that I would, that I noticed first off the bat that I'm like, I wish it would do this, or I wish it wouldn't do this. And, you know, basically four of those things are hardware issues would require hardware changes. I'll put it that way. And the, uh, the APRS reply thing that can be fixed in firmware and software. I'm not really worried about that. And I also noticed that there was a problem with the, uh, the power meter when I was at POTA. The power meter would sometimes drop, but the power output on the radio was fine. So it was just a problem with the meter. I believe that was fixed in the latest firmware. I haven't taken the radio out back out to a park since I updated to the latest firmware. There's a firmware from May of 2025. Came out a couple weeks ago, really shortly after Hamvention, actually. And I think that fixed the power meter thing, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to check on that and see and we'll go from there. So I'll probably do a follow-up video to this later on. But I wonder what you guys think about these five things. And I wonder if you've noticed anything else that's kind of like a showstopper for you. If, you were, if you've seen something, whether you, if you don't own the radio, what stopped you from buying it if you wanted it? Or if you do own the radio, if you're like, man, this just, I don't like this feature at all. I wish it would, would do or would not do this thing. Put a comment in the description below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. 73.